Feeling pretty good, all things considered. Bottom line, I'm in here for high-dose chemo and for bone marrow slash stem cell transplant. I'm 40, wonderful wife and four young kids, age one and a half, five, seven, and nine. I've been a firefighter for almost 17 years and I have occupational cancer. A year ago, I was diagnosed. They found a tumor the size of a grapefruit in my chest between my heart and my lung. Doesn't look like it, because I have hair now, which I didn't before, but I am undergoing chemo as we speak. Soon, a few weeks, going in for a bone marrow and stem cell transplant. I'll be in the hospital for weeks, not only away from the fire department that I love, but away from my family that I love more than anything. That's gonna be the hard part. I'm gonna be a bubble boy. Last three weeks in here, just trying to make the best of it. I don't see my family that much. Not because they don't want to be here, I don't think. We didn't think anything like this was going to occur, and the fact that it did was really hard on our family. I don't like my dad being sick. I feel really lonely when he's not here. I was noticing that he couldn't play catch with me and stuff, and that's one of his favorite things to do. He can't pick me up anymore, and I don't like how that feels. I didn't want to be alone. Worry. Scared, everything. She's just an awesome mom, raising four kids under the age of 10, and you never hear her complain. She works so hard. She never gets credit for any of this. I never thought I'd be here at this age. I'll just make the best of it. I hope to be home soon. I had warning signs like six, seven months before. I was on this health kick, like, you know, getting the music cranking, working out every day, eating right, drinking less, trying to take care of myself. Excuse me. And I would just get like, you should be getting stronger. I was getting weaker. Fatigue was the biggest thing. Massive fatigue, irritability, couldn't breathe. I'd get winded. Glenn's first symptoms were chest pain and shortness of breath. And when they became severe enough, he sought medical attention. And unfortunately, that's when his mass was discovered. But to look at him, he looked no different than anyone else that you might run into on the street. The tradition is to work through everything in the job. And I did. And maybe if I didn't, they would have got this a lot sooner. So it's a little late. I'm not done and dead. I ain't going down like that. Today's definitely one of my better days. There's no way you would have been able to film yesterday. It's hard to talk about what the bad days are like because it feels like I'm complaining. They said I would never complain. I'm not a victim, I'm a victor. I never asked why me, and I still don't. Hundreds of Boston Fire, I'm gonna die from cancer. I know why. I know why. A big part of it is exposure to smoke and the various components of smoke. Over time, if you're a firefighter for 10, 20, 30 years, that chronic low-level exposure unfortunately can trigger a variety of different cancers. Lung cancers, digestive cancers, bladder cancer, even cancers that have not traditionally been associated with smoke exposures, including lymphoma, are more common in firefighters. When there's smoke, there is cancer. When you see smoke, when you smell the smoke, when you taste the smoke, when you feel the smoke, you've already been exposed to these cancer-causing chemicals. They're already starting the process of being absorbed in your body through inhalation, absorption, and ingestion. I did take smoke then when I didn't have to. No one told me to. It was just kind of what we did. We'd be taking it, coughing, choking, spitting, and then, you know, have a headache for two or three days. If this is what was coming into my body being absorbed, then into my bloodstream. We didn't talk about cancer in the firehouse. We didn't talk about cancer anywhere. It's not burns or falling through a roof or off a roof or getting caught and trapped and burning to death. Friggin' cancer, that's got me now. Sick from it. No glory in that. Hey, look at me. No glory in that at all. You can't change anything or any reason why I'm in here. There's no going back in time and protecting myself better. I've certainly got plenty of time to think about that now. Because I'm living in the hospital for the month of October. Who I am and what I love has been taken away from me because I can't work. It's definitely taken a toll on his psyche and on his mental health. Not being able to go back to work, not being able to feel a part of his firefighter community, I think that's been hard on him. I just want Glenn to go back to work and be that strong man that he was when I first met him. And that'll make me the happiest. It wouldn't be winning the lottery, it wouldn't be anything else. It would just to see that smile on his face because he worked so hard.
the intention is to perform something called a stem cell transplant, which involves very high doses of chemotherapy, and then the patient receives their own immature blood cells called stem cells to help their bone marrow recover from that high-dose chemotherapy. The next six weeks for Glenn are gonna be extremely tough. He'll be confined to a hospital because there's high risk of getting infections when we have to suppress his immune system. He'll be away from his family, his loved ones, and it's gonna be a very challenging course of action for Glenn. The patient is in a specially filtered and isolated room. Psychologically, it's challenging to be cooped up for that long. Even after he leaves the hospital, his immune system will be compromised for several months. So there are significant restrictions on what he can eat, where he can go, what he can do. Everyone that comes into this room to visit me or work on me, like nurses, even doctors, must wear a surgical face mask. The reason for that is because I do not have an immune system because the high-dose chemotherapy fighting the blood cancer I have took that from me. So if I do get sick, it can kill me because I can't fight it off. I'm 41 next month, the same day as my daughter's birthday, October 5th. I'm not going to be there. She doesn't know that yet. She's talking to me. Oh, she can't wait to spend it with me. We're going to have a special day. I'm not going to have a special day with Sage that day. I'm not going to see her that day. I'm not going to be able to hold her, hug her, any of that. And I'm just not going to be able to, because I'm going to be living in a friggin' bubble at the Brigham and Women's. That's what sucks. It sucks a lot. Sage just turned eight. I missed her birthday again, like I did last year because of cancer. I promised her this year to be there. How does an eight-year-old supposed to understand that my dad's sick again, he's not at my birthday? It's hard to see someone who was so strong to be so sick. The kids, you know, miss certain things with him, but with time. I'm a little five-year-old watching gymnastics the other day. She's like, Dad, I'm gonna do that when I grow up, when I learn how. I said, it's awesome, Grace. And she says to me, will you come? Will you come watch me, and cheer me on like that girl's dad is? Absolutely, Grace, you know I'll be there for you. I'll be there. Did you promise? Yeah, I promise, Grace, I'll be there. You know what I'm thinking in my head? You know? That's the stuff that gets to me. I don't feel sorry for myself and my kids. I love them so much and they love me a little back. They love me a lot and I'm missing that. That's what scares me, the kids. You know, being without a dad. Next week, my one-year-old turns two. That's Faithlin, the baby. And I have all intentions of being home, watching her you know, jam her face into a little cupcake or something. I will not be here at Christmas. I don't care how sick I am, I will not be here at Christmas. I'll be home in front of the tree, watching him open the presents that Santa brought them. So Christmas is coming. I'll be there for her this time. You ready? You don't know. You go to the hospital because you just don't feel right. That's always how it starts. Ask anybody that got it, I guarantee. I just didn't feel right. Why I didn't feel right? And once they tell you that news, that's it. It's on. And anything else you want to get, that's off. Be safe. We have the ability to do that now. We got the equipment, we got the knowledge. You can do that, you know? Too easy. But if I think that maybe if I wore my mask more, I like building fires, maybe didn't take it off so soon, Excuse me, I'm okay. With the slightest bit of smoke, it's okay to put it on. But now we have bottles that last longer. We got 45 minute bottles now. Now there's really no reason to have it off. You have that air now. Wearing a fire mask, maybe I didn't think it was comfortable then. This certainly isn't comfortable. Stem sticking out of my chest. I killed it with being able to go back to work right now and wear a mask. Protect yourselves. Don't be sitting in this chair looking at a camera in a couple of months or a couple of years because you're sick. Maybe you got kids or a mom or anybody you can think of. Do it for them. You don't care about your own life. I know you care about your kids.